Hi, I'm Dan Robinson with the Great Lakes Spirituality Project, and I'm very excited today to welcome Jane Elder to our conversation. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks. Jane currently serves as the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters, a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating a better world by connecting Wisconsin people and ideas. That includes work around the arts, sustainability, science and culture, and the public exchange of ideas around these topics. She was the founding director of the Sierra Club's Great Lakes program and led the organization's Midwest office for many years, spearheading advances in water quality, air quality, and public lands protection in the region. She was the first recipient of Sierra Club's Michael McCloskey Award, which honors a distinguished record of achievement in national or international conservation causes. She's also led several projects related to advancing the goals of the Federal Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the US-Canada Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Jane's an active supporter of and participant in the arts, including serving as the founding board president of the Forward Theater Company in Madison, Wisconsin. Wow, there's a lot more I could have mentioned, Jane. So you're a very <laughs> busy person. And and on top of all that, you're getting ready to retire from the yes. Wisconsin Academy this year after serving as the executive direct, director for almost 10 years, right? Is yes, right? correct. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Uh, retirement's a big moment in life. And as you look back over your work, particularly in connection to the Great Lakes, um, what's one or two things you feel most satisfied with? Wow. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot there. Um, but, you know, I was, I was thrilled to be part of what I call the second wave of activism on the Great Lakes and an era when we were actually winning things in Congress. And there's a whole generation that has never tasted victory uh, in, in the United States Congress. Um, but uh, I was uh, so thrilled to be part of uh, several major initiatives. Um, a couple things that I think about. Um, one is um, place-based. Um, I've spent a lot of time working um, in those in those years on the national lake shores in the Great Lakes region, um, and one of my absolute favorites is Pictured Rocks National Lake Shore, and uh, I was involved in the uh, the generation of work on trying to get funding for the lake shore, um, the management plans for the lake shore, and sort of the long term vision and direction after the uh, original authorizations went through, and there was in the original plan a plan for a road, a paved road all along the escarpment, top of the cliffs um, for a better view of the lake, <clears throat> right? Um, and so that um, amazing, beautiful backcountry that is there now along the trail would have been a paved road. Mm. And um, cutting through the Beaver Basin um, all the way between uh, well, the, the Western shore down by Munising all the way to Grand Marais. And for those of us who loved the wild character of pictured rocks and the undeveloped character, the road just seemed like the worst possible thing you could do to that wild and beautiful place. But it was in the original plan and the authorization. So a number of us worked with members of the Michigan congressional delegation to deauthorize the road because uh, there are two stages in Congress, right? There's the authorization for Congress to do something and then there's the appropriations to pay for it. And as long as it was, as it was authorized, somebody could get an appropriation and it would go ahead. And so um, at that point, our champion was Congressman Bob Carr. He represented the Lansing to sort of Pontiac uh, uh, congressional district, um, took a lot of work, took a lot of effort, but we deauthorized the road. And so when I go back to Pictured Rocks now and I stand on those sandy shores or those cliffs and there's not a large Winnebago <laughs> going <down. laughs> And they have their place, right? People should be able to enjoy these parks in lots of different ways. But the remnants of the wild are so, so limited in the Great Lakes region that to be able to protect that place um, uh, in that way uh, for me is one of the, the great life achievements that we, we gave the birch trees and the beaver and the wind and the wild that escarpment as opposed to the pavement. And for me, that's uh, an important contribution and I will always uh, be happy about that choice. Um, so my other work, uh, I think um, 
a lot of people don't think about the Clean Air Act as um, uh, protecting water quality. But uh, I worked for many years on Section 112 of the Clean Air Act, uh, the last version that passed in 1990, uh, those amendments. And it uh, identified uh, some of the worst airborne toxic pollutants that were affecting the Great Lakes food web. And these included the old pesticides like um, DDT and its metabolites. It also included things like PCBs, which uh, tend to cycle in the atmosphere and the right conditions, uh, dioxin, it's a nasty list. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got that in the Clean Air Act um, and not just to protect the Great Lakes, but other aquatic systems around the United States and the world. And so um, what I think about what it takes to, to get a bill through Congress and what it takes on something as large and fundamental as the Clean Air Act, um, I'm very proud of the work we did there to raise the awareness of the connection between air quality, toxic substances, and the ecological quality of the lakes, and the awareness we built for other aquatic systems uh, in the United States and around the world, because the Great Lakes food chain has often been a model for other freshwater systems. So those are, those are two of the big ones. Oh. <laughs> Um, there's more things and uh, they're all, you know, it's a lot of work, a lot of, uh, traffic of activity, if you will, uh, around the Great Lakes. But those are the two where I, uh, at least today I'm thinking back on, <clears throat> um, for me as a personal one, the Michigan wilderness bill as probably my, um, uh, you know, when my ashes get scattered somewhere, I want somebody to mention the <laughs> Michigan wilderness bill, uh, a mere 10,000 or hundred thousand acres, um, but uh, of course, all of Michigan is in the Great Lakes watershed, except for a tiny little sliver on the southwest side. And so those protected headwaters, those beautiful places, um, those places of remarkable habitat and beauty um, um, are as protected as something can be in the modern world. And so um, uh, they too contribute to the water quality in the watershed and uh, the ecological life of the Great Lakes system. So. That would be my third if I can sneak. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I got to tell you that uh, Pictured Rocks is one of my favorite places in the basin. So thank you for your work on that. In fact, that you can't see it here, but my wife, we took a picture of, of the uh, part of that lake shore and blew it up into a big poster and I have it hung mm. on the wall. So, uh, so thanks for your work with that. As you describe that, um, you use the phrase, the wind in the wild. And you um, made reference to the Michigan wilderness protection work that you had done. So that sense of wild, the, when, when people use that phrase, there's almost a spiritual quality to that. Can you talk a little bit more about what you, how you understand that? Sure. Um, one of the moments we had with the Michigan wilderness bill, and I'll probably get choked up if I talk about it. <laughs> uh, Congressman Dale Kildee was one of our champions. And Dale was not an outdoorsy kind of guy, right? And even when he came, we did a tour of a number of the prospective areas. And I think he was in the newest pair of blue jeans I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying so hard because he's used to being in his suit in Washington, DC. Yeah. But Dale came along as a, as a, he wanted to learn, he wanted to understand and know. And we were on the shores of uh, Horseshoe Bay, which is just above the, the Straits of Mackinac and a, curved shore of, at that point, I guess, Lake Huron. Uh, beautiful cedar trees, the classic, uh, the smell of the cedars coming up, a little creek coming down to the sandy beach. And he just stood there and he said, you know, he said something like, I see why you want to protect places like this. And he said, when you think about it, um, you know, this has been, this is the sign of God's creation. He said, this is like the mind of God expressed. And I was just thunderstruck by that. Um, and we learned over, uh, over dinner that he had actually studied um, to become, I believe, a Jesuit priest. Uh, uh -huh. But his life had gone into a different direction. And he knew so much about the history of the area and the missionaries and St. Ignace. And, and it was remarkable, um, uh, both his uh, history and intellect, but also his awareness that this just wasn't about acreage and trees and something on a map. There was something um, ineffable <laughs> about these places. And when, when he talked about the mind of God expressed in terms of you know, the, the, just seeing the design of creation 
And whether you believe in evolution or you know, whatever your creation story is, it was beautiful and profound. And it really spoke to me and everybody who was in the group. And I think some of the other folks were on the congressional tour were like, well, he's gone. He, they, they've got his vote. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what these places do for us. And I think you know, in today's world, wilderness is a fraught concept. Um, and that some people see it as a romanticized um, uh, you know, version of a certain era or a certain privileged class or a way to fence people out. Uh, but what, regardless of what we call these places um, where you can experience nature through its own design and its own systems of living. Um, and whether, like I said, whether you believe this is, is you know, God's design or the, the miracle of evolution, whatever, it's magical. <laughs> it's magical. Um, I've often wondered, what is it about um, humans and evolution that attracts us to beauty, right? Mm. Um, uh, because we all have a sense of what is beautiful. And, um, and I have a friend who's done a lot of research in Africa and he talks about, you know, um, there's something about uh, the trees and water and sky, you know, we were evolved <laughs> to relate to places that nurture us, whether it's from a food supply or water. But there's also something, um, you know, why do we love a view? Um, uh, what is it about a birch tree that, you know, speaks to us? But whatever that is, it certainly speaks to me and I think it speaks to a lot of other people. And I also find it humbling uh, particularly on the shore of a great lake. And we were just up uh, in Lake Superior country last week. The vastness of all that water, the exquisite uh, living system, um, the clarity of the stuff that life is made of. You know, it's, it's um, how, how splendidly lucky we are <laughs> to live in this part of the galaxy <laughs> on the water planet and to the best of our knowledge, there's nothing else like it uh, out in certainly our solar system and maybe not even our galaxy. And to be able to have this exquisite beauty as part of our life experience. Um, uh, you know, it's hard to put, put it to words, but uh, it's, it's why I need to be in those places and to stand on those shores from time to time and, um, and to have my time with the big lakes. Sure. You mentioned the concept of beauty. Um... I know that you've been a supporter of the arts and involved in the arts for many years. And, and certainly that is one expression of the beautiful. And so do you see a connection between the work or your connection to the arts and to the Great Lakes? Is there, is there a, a place that those two parts of your life meet? Oh, well, sure. I mean, the, the, one of the, the amazing things about the arts, right? And the same thing with poetry and, and uh, exquisite writing is that allows you to see things through a different layer of meaning and a different layer of knowledge and a different layer of the human experience. Um, and so art can speak to us in the ways that a white paper <laughs> does not or a congressional bill does not. Um, and uh, it, it opens your eyes and opens your experience to just different ways of seeing things than we, we typically do in the world. Um, I mean, one of my favorite uh, Great Lakes paintings is by Frances Hopkins. And, um, and she traveled, um, she was you know, a, a trained in the, the genteel ladies art of watercolor and painting and went along with her husband in the Voyager canoes and they're oh, really wow. early eras of the, um, the, the, the fur trade. And her um, landscapes and her waterscapes, if you will, of the Great Lakes at that era, one, they're amazing paintings, but two, you can see both her awe, I'm sure as a, as a you know, woman of European background with the landscape, with the power of the water. There's one where they're coming through the rapids, um, extraordinary and it helps you see both the times but also her lens as a newcomer to this world um, and then uh, Canada's um, uh, National Art Museum in, in Ottawa has some remarkable paintings from the group of nine 
the Canadian painters, um, uh, and uh, and several of them are in, from Great Lakes country, and you get a sense of the raw country and the force of cold and the size of these trees, and the human relationship to the landscape. Anyway, uh, yeah, art tells art helps us see things and experience things and uh, see that through the eyes of of someone who's trying to convey their own ideas without words. So, um, you know, uh, what's the, the saying that um, <clears throat> the earth without art um, is just, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd heard that before, that's really good. <laughs> so they have A-R-T in the middle, right? Yeah. Oh. Oh. So, and every culture has made its own art um, over the times that, uh, again, in, in Canada's, um, uh, amazing uh, National Gallery. They have some exquisite uh, early uh, uh, beadwork and uh, and a beaver pelt and other things that we just anyway. Every culture experiences art in its own way, and those those objects and those artists help us see the world with deeper dimensions. So, as you think about the Great Lakes, um, uh, this is a big question. I realize that, but. So what place do you feel like that lakes have in your work, but also your personal life? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, in my work, they have been one of my driven mission areas for probably 30 years of my life. Um, you know, we all make choices about where am I going to put my time and energy? And there was just something about the Great Lakes that said to me, I got to work on this. I have to do this. They're big, they're precious, they're vulnerable, they're important. I have skills. Um, let me help, let me be uh, in this space. And I want to, um, I've always wanted to do what I can to protect and cherish and safeguard this remarkable gift on planet Earth. Um, you know, fresh water is such a rare thing on our planet. We tend not to think about it. But when you look at the percentages, it's a tiny little bit of, of the water on Earth. And we tend to take the lakes for granted and we tend to take this miracle of the glaciers um, for granted. And I think as we're heading into really challenging times now with the climate, even more so the risk is there. So from a professional standpoint, because I care deeply about them as a sense of place and a sense of personal connection, um, it was an easy choice to, to do this work. And frankly, working with other people who are passionate about the Great Lakes, is very rewarding and often a lot of fun. Hmm. You know, you're not in it because it's on the job description. You're in it because you care. And to be around other people who care and are willing to roll up their sleeves and spend their time and do the really hard, boring, sometimes tedious work to move bills through Congress or to get a regulation dealt with or to raise public awareness. Um, they're a good group to hang out with. I like the Great Lakes crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's been my experience so far. You know, I, I, I've enjoyed that sense of community yeah. with, when people have a shared task and a shared passion that they care about something. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my personal connection to the Great Lakes probably goes back to my mom. Um, she was born and raised in the Marquette area. And, uh, and then, um, and so her childhood was filled uh, with the Great Lakes pretty much in, <laughs> down the street and, and uh, down the road. And so they lived with the seasons of Lake Superior. They uh, took little adventures as a family to places in the region. So she always loved it. Um, and uh, my grandmother was widowed in uh, 1929, right at the beginning of the depression. My grandfather died from one of those, the flu epidemics that is lesser known than the Spanish flu, but they were pretty nasty. And uh, we lost a lot of people at that era as well. So my widowed grandmother was raising four daughters alone <clears throat> through the depression in Marquette with a dairy cow in the backyard. And they would sell cream and butter to the neighbors. And she took in sewing and they had a, you know, they did what they could. Uh, as World War II came around, the sisters one by one started moving to Southern Michigan to get jobs primarily in the auto industry and other industries that were ramping up around the war. So they all moved and uh, my grandmother and, and one aunt ended up in Flint. Um, my mother was there with them for a while. My other aunts in Detroit. Long story short, um, my mother longed <laughs> for Marquette and the Great Lakes. So when my parents were married after the war, 
my mother said to him, because they were living with my grandma in Flint at that point, she said, I'm not going to raise kids in the city. Mm. And so they became part of the first generation of commuting workers. Um, and my dad worked for AC Spark Plug, and they moved to a little place called uh, Pine Lake uh, in Genesee County outside of the town of Linden and, uh, and built a house there. And I got to grow up on a little lake uh, in Southern Michigan. But when I was five, um, four or five, my mom went up for a high school reunion and we all got to go. And, and this little picture I keep uh, on my bookshelf here is my brother and me and mom on the shores of Lake Superior on that trip. And nice. I got my doll with me. <laughs> but I had never seen water that big before or that cold. And I remember the first time the waves were coming in. We had no experience, right, as kids. My brother was smarter than I was. And I just walked up to the edge of the lake. And the first thing that happened was a big one just hit me right across, the room, knocked me oh. down, icy cold lake superior water. I shrieked, but it was also kind of wonderful, right? For nature to have that kind of power. And so I, I'll never forget that cold encounter with the big lake. <clears throat> and, uh, and because of her enthusiasm and uh, other reasons, I just uh, have had that connection. We went up on other trips and other reunions. and uh, But because we were living on a little lake, my dad's notion was, why take a vacation to a lake when you live on one? <laughs> so I didn't have a lot of other experience other than those occasional trips up to the Marquette area. But um, uh, you know, in college and beyond, uh, when I have the capacity, um, the lakes have sort of always been part of my plans. And, uh, and, you know, I came into college during the 70s when the environmental movement, early 70s, was really taking off. John Denver was singing about the mountains. It was the cool thing to do. I became a backpacker. Um, I did my first trip with a, a girlfriend in the Porcupine Mountains and the spectacular view up there. And one of my, my early and more important trips was um, the first long one I took to Pictured Rocks. And I spent my sesquicentennial in uh, 1976. We had the entire Mosquito Beach campground to ourselves. Wow. At that point, you could do campfires and cook on the ground. Um, uh, we brought in each one sparkler a piece because we didn't want to do anything harmful to this site. And we knew we'd have to pack it out. And I was there with uh, somebody really special to me. And we watched the sunset and Lake Superior in the entire, like I said, the entire campground all by ourselves on um, the American sesquicentennial. And I thought, this is freedom. This, nice, <laughs> this. nice. So anyway, um, and that particular site, Mosquito Beach, um, uh, I love the name because it keeps people out. <laughs> 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 but uh, where, the, where the river comes into the lake there, that is one of my sacred places. Um, and not the only one, but it's probably my one of my most treasured places in the Great Lakes Basin. Again, the beauty, the power of the lake, the, uh, the, the scent of the air, the lightness um, on your skin. This, anyway, it's a it's a place I love and will always love and always try to protect. Well, that's that's a great. Those are great stories. Um, I, I'll never, I'll never forget my first encounter with Lake Superior, and it was similar to your story about the cold <laughs> water. Well, I was a grown adult, and I should have known better, but it was still like, oh my goodness, goodness. Um, you know, in our exchange of, of of emails leading up to this interview, you wrote that the that um, the lakes, as you said, are important to me in spiritual ways that language sometimes fails to describe. Yeah. But I'm happy to talk about it. And and again, when you were talking about um, your visits to near Lake Superior, you use the word sacred. So yeah. as best as you can, how would you describe the spiritual aspect or the spiritual importance of the Great Lakes to you? You know, it is, it is challenging for language. And, um, but I, I have a manuscript that I'm working on for a, a book and it talks about uh, another trip back to Pictured Rocks <laughs> with another colleague. And, and this is one where it was fall and the splendid colors of the valley, um, just spectacular, but the, the golden of the birch. Anyway, it was a gorgeous time. And he was a California guy. So I was introducing him to the magic of the Midwest. Um, and we were on top of one of the bluffs um, along the Lakeshore Trail and a flock of Canada geese was, was coming across the lake. And they fly really low. 
Um, and it's a big expanse for any bird. <laughs> They're heavy birds. <laughs> so they have to make it across the lake. So they've been flying all the way across Lake Superior. And we were on top of the bluff and they, and, uh, and they were not gonna go, they were not gonna go out very much. They're not gonna get much altitude because they're using all of their efficiencies. And Carl and I stood there and we could feel as they flew over us, the downdraft from their wings, the beat mm. on their wings and the call. And it was sudden and the, this cacophony of the geese and then they were gone and the silence and just us at the lake and the waves. And it was, but we looked at each other and we just couldn't speak. It was just this remarkable thing of this moment in nature where we were just part of that. Um, and so I wrote later about, you know, for me, this is one of the places with a, you know, a Christian background of the still waters and the green pastures mm. um, and to, to feel blessed in that space. But it also reminded me of um, the Hawaiian and the Polynesian concept of mana. Are you familiar with mana? Mm. It's a, again, a hard word to define, particularly if you're not you know, in that culture. Uh, but uh, it's, I, I, I actually looked it up today because I was thinking about it. Uh, good old Merriam Webster talks about the power of the elemental forces of nature embodied in an object or person. Uh -huh. and that's such a, such a dry word. But mana is, a, is like spiritual power from the landscape or being in the landscape. And there are many sacred sites in Hawaiian islands and, and one of my favorites is the, the Hula Temple on the island of Kauai. And I was talking with um, uh, someone from the local town there about our experience. And he said, ah, oh, there's a lot of mana up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we knew what we meant, that something right. profoundly powerful about being in that place. And whether it's a combination of beauty, maybe it's the history of the land, maybe it's a sacred site in someone, someone's culture, but um, there's that, there's the Hawaiian mana. And I also thought about the biblical manna, right? Which uh -huh. is a spiritual food in the wilderness. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you have these religious traditions that link this, this notion of sustenance from place. Um, and it's not just uh, a biological sustenance. It is some kind of powerful thing we get back. We, I go to these places because they renew me in ways. They humble me. They make me feel connected to Earth's natural systems, to the exquisite designs of nature, and to being really small in a very large universe and somehow privileged to be in this living universe. So that's my struggle around language. But this notion of mana um, uh, sticks with me and uh, and you know and we're modern Americans are not the first culture to have found spiritual power in these landscapes obviously and there are many sacred sites that uh, are very important to the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes um, and so uh, you know for my generation or at least for me um, they are they are important to me as a human being they are important to me um, as sacred places, as places that have spiritual value, um, as the idea of God expressed, uh, all of those things. A, a couple of weeks ago, I was a couple of weekends ago. I was up at L Ludington State Park, mm -hmm. and we were there at sunset. It was a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful night. Just, just enough clouds to to throw the colors, just the whole the whole rainbow of colors over the over the water. And it was a busy uh, time at the park. It was very full. So down by the lakeshore, there was a huge crowd of people sort of making this pilgrimage down to the lake for the, for the sunset. And at one point, um, the sun had gone down and just had that glow. You couldn't see the orb anymore. Mm -hmm. It just had that glow in the sky. And somebody started clapping. And like it was a performance. And a couple other people, it wasn't a lot of folks, but a few people were clapping like, this was, this was great. Just kind of like showing that emotional appreciation. And I think about the people that I've talked to and how many folks have, whether they put it in spiritual terms, I would argue that that's kind of what it is for them, their connection to the lakes. And yet the flip side of that is a lot of those folks don't necessarily, some do, but a lot of folks don't necessarily take that next step of taking an action to protect the lakes. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on this idea of the connection between 
a spiritual experience of this place and then taking a practical action towards protecting that spiritual source. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, there's was polling out many years ago when I was working on the Great Lakes where our, our brilliant pollster said, well, what we've determined is a lot of people like the Great Lakes, but the people who fight for them love them and more people need to love them. And I don't know if you know the author Kathleen Dean Moore. Um, she has a beautiful essay about what it means to love a place oh, wow. that has really stuck with me. And she writes about, um, you know, if you really love a place, you are willing to make sacrifices for it. You know, like you would for a child, like you would for someone else you cared about. But you're willing to set aside your own needs at times for the needs of this place. And it's a, it's a beautiful essay and I really recommend it to people. Again, Kathleen Dean Moore. Um, and that has really stuck with me that um, I know it's a privilege, right? For me to actually be able to live in this region, to live in a place with abundant fresh water, to be able to afford a trip to the Great Lakes. And I wanna always have that self-awareness that it is an extreme privilege for me to experience these lakes and their beauty. Um, I also know how vulnerable they are. And, uh, and so I made a choice to be willing to do what I could within, within my skill sets, my reason, you know, what can I offer? How can I help? Um, and I made the choice, uh, but there's a lot of people who take them for granted. A lot of people who don't know the lakes are vulnerable or a lot of people just overwhelmed by the state of the world. Yeah. <laughs> These days, that's very true. Yes. And, and so it's easy to want to throw up your hands and say, it's all hopeless. Uh, and there's also the, well, it is hopeless. So let's party till the end. Right? <laughs> or the cynical version of, well, my generation will squeak through, but too bad about the next one, you know? Uh, and so uh, I, I also love the writings of Vaclav Havel, um, the, the poet uh, who distinguishes between optimism and hope and optimism sort of being a decision to be cheerful in spite of the facts, um, <laughs> but hope as a beautifully irrational act that knowing the facts to carve out just enough to think maybe there's another way, right? Maybe there's something we haven't thought about yet. Maybe if we pull together. And so I choose to be in a place of hope, but not optimism. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but it takes a lot of work um, to protect something that many people take for granted. Um, I was in a conversation with somebody else just a couple of weeks ago about um, uh, you know, nature does not compromise. Our, our political systems are set up around compromise and debate, but the laws of physics do not care whether this is a Republican or Democratic issue. Yeah. Climate change is not going to put itself off by 30 years just because it's inconvenient to us. Uh, nature does not negotiate. Um, nature adapts, uh, but some ways, uh, in some ways, those adaptations are extinction. Those adaptations are algal blooms in our water. Those adaptations are scarcity. Um, those adaptations are loss of beauty, because you know the the natural world is going to do what it can with the biochemistry <laughs> that's been handed to it, um, and so. You know, the assumptions are um, that we can fix it down the road and you can in a lot of policy, but not when it comes to some of these environmental decisions. You know, extinction is forever, despite the folks who are into the Jurassic Park stuff. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, you know, there's an old saying in the environmental movement, um, uh, all of our victories are temporary, all of our losses are permanent. Right? Those are hard things hard things, but uh, we are in a new era in terms of the human relationship with the biosphere. Um, and most people haven't figured that out. <laughs> uh, this summer's issues, I hope, uh, with the, the forest fires out west and the crop losses, um, 
uh, and the flooding, uh, I hope, hope more people figure this out. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, I'm rambling on this point. <laughs> well, you mentioned um, the laws of nature and, and some and some losses are permanent. And it made me think of your work. I didn't mention this at the beginning of the interview, but your work as the founding director of the Biodiversity Project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is a, nation, a nationwide in, initiative to raise public awareness about the value of Earth's diverse species, habitats, and ecosystems, and to promote responsive action to stem the tide of loss. And, and in that work, and in, in a book that you helped write or wrote yourself, Ethics for a Small Planet, you talk a bit about the ethical and theological underpinnings for this work. Could you say a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're our relationship with nature um, is um, one where there are moral and ethical choices. Right? Uh, as, as humans, as the dominant species on the planet uh, in what is now called the Anthropocene, right? We're driving. <laughs> uh, we now have to assume uh, an important moral and ethical uh, burden, if you will, in our relationship with each other and also nature and the planet. And when we were working on the biodiversity project, one of the things we realized, and this actually came out of scientific research and, and social science and focus groups, that for a lot of people, um, their respect for God's creation was one of the reasons that they and many people think we should protect nature. Um, and while religion is not always the, the primary source of morals and ethics for all people in all times, it's certainly a powerful one for many people on the planet. So we took a deep look <clears throat> at what are the moral and ethical and religious underpinnings that help us make uh, decisions about our relationship with nature. So it was a fascinating project um, with limited resources. We, we focused mostly on um, the dominant religions in the United States at the time with a, a pretty deep look at aspects of Christianity and uh, Judaism, uh, but also touched on other practices from um, uh, you know, the Muslim faith to uh, just a, a variety of other perspectives. And there was a much larger project uh, taken on, on by the, um, uh, I'm gonna lose the name here, with the, the Forum on uh, Religion and the Environment published an amazing uh, piece of work on just sort of all the world's religions and the environmental perspectives in them. But one of the things we looked at was, uh, for example, <clears throat> um, uh, from various traditions, you know, what is our moral obligation to the future? Mm. Uh, what is our moral obligation to nature? Um, I loved uh, one of our, our participants was Rabbi Daniel Schwartz. Um, and, uh, and he talked about, you know, the first commandment was to tend the garden. Yeah, before the 10 come along, God says, take care of the garden. <laughs> and I've loved that one. Uh, we also explored concepts such as care for creation and stewardship, which come out of the Christian tradition. Um, the notion of the Sabbath for the land, right, which comes out of the Jewish tradition that every seven years you would give the land a rest uh, to protect the fertility of the fields and such. So we looked at the, the traditions that are out there um, and some that are problematic and some that are promising and uh, lots of discussions on dominionism, right? Mm. What does it mean in the Christian tradition to have dominion? Um, does it mean um, dominion over the forces of the world at a spiritual level or does it mean to dominate? nature and how that's been interpreted over the years. So it also opened up conversations. Um, we had a number of uh, uh, multi-faith uh, conversations with our leadership group. We looked at um, how religious leaders were approaching these topics. Um, and for me, it was a, both a fascinating conversation about everything from the roots of ethics um, to the role religion plays. And uh, our ethicist on the project, um, who did not have a, a religious background when we did our, a workshop in the National Cathedral said, oh my goodness, an academic ethicist walked into a church and nothing fell. <laughs> 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 but we had, we had a rabbi, we had Christian leaders, we had a Wiccan, um, we had uh, indigenous leadership. It was about what is it from these faith traditions and our religious practice that 
inspires us or sometimes uh, uh, releases us from the obligation to care for nature. But um, we also did some translation work, you know, how, do envir how can environmentalists work with religious leaders and how can religious leaders work with environmentalists and what do those partnerships look like? How to respect uh, multiple traditions uh, and understand uh, different origins. But uh, at the end of it, whether you're coming at it from just a Western ethics standpoint, um, or whether you're looking at it from religious, religious standpoint, there's a you know, deep human cultural tradition on uh, being aware of our relationship with nature. One of my favorite ones was the thousand years of Western history in less than a thousand words. Oh, wow. <laughs> we called it the Guido Sarducci version. <laughs> <laughs> but looking back to you know, the Greeks um, and, uh, and uh, all the way up to um, modern systems. So it, it, useful to look at what is it about what we think we know and why we know it and why we're certain about things and to unpack some of those things from religious traditions. And it certainly helped me understand more about some of the tensions between um, certain, certain versions of dominion uh, versus this concept of creation care. And, um, and so anyway, that's, that was part of that project. And uh, while it's been many, many years since Ethics for a Small Planet has been in print, it's still circulating around on Amazon and every now and then I see it there. Um, and for me, it was a really satisfying project to work on. And I was so honored um, to be uh, working with some of the, the really big thinkers uh, in this space and was thrilled to work with um, uh, oh, Mary Evelyn and John, uh, who are working on the, the, the big international analysis of um, relationship between religion and the environment. So lots of definitions of the word sacred uh, and lots of definitions of what it means to live a moral life on planet Earth. So. Wow, that sounds like an amazing project. Uh, it was fun. I'd love to do it again. But... <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, I, I, that's a great place to end it because I think there's a lot of food for thought there. And, and Jane, I, I, I can't thank you enough. This has been a fascinating, wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. Well, it's been a real pleasure. I, I hope that other people you know, think about uh, what makes a place special to me in a way that I can't describe. What makes me want to return to a place? What makes me want to care for a place? Because there's, there's something powerfully human in there and probably powerfully spiritual. And uh, I know my life is richer for having that awareness that uh, when I go to a place, I'm not just... Um, uh, a tourist uh, mm -hmm. or, or a visitor, um, at least with the Great Lakes, I have a relationship and, and we know each other, the Great Lakes and I, and I hope other people will explore that relationship as well. That I-thou connection, mm -hmm. I-thou relationship. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jane, so much. You thank take you. care. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.